I want to tell you a little bit about how this talk came about, and this is probably something for those of you who are interested in doing wilderness medicine, travel medicine, expedition medicine as a career. Um, you know, I have uh, many, many years as being an expert in avalanche safety and uh, non-avalanche snow suffocation. I've written a bunch about it and done some uh, uh, expert witness work on snow suffocation. And um, I was quite interested in this phenomenon of avalanche airbag backpacks, how they didn't really, they haven't really caught on in the United States. And um, uh, as it turns out, if you know anything about avalanche safety, most people carry a beacon or a transceiver, a shovel and a probe. And, but it turns out that avalanche airbag is statistically the thing that reduces uh, morbidity the most. Um, and so, I actually wrote a, quite a bit about this and in the medical journals and sold a story to Outside Magazine and wrote a story on Outside Magazine on why people aren't adopting airbags. And it was pretty well received. And I wrote some uh, somewhat controversial. And um, months later, uh, we had a rescue on Mountain Hood, which involved uh, two climbers. One died uh, during the mission. And my editor at Outside Magazine called me and said, can you do a story about this rescue? And I said, well, after you know discussing it for quite a while, I said, well, I'm limited to how much I can disclose because I'm a physician on the mission, medical director for the recovery, and the body was still on the mountain. It was still an active mission. Uh, but it turned into a story about the record number of rescues on Mount Hood. And that's what I'm gonna talk about tonight. And so, um, if, if you have an opportunity to be involved in something, those things that are timely, and you probably all know this, if you're all on social media and you're all, and you're involved in today's, um, medicine and today's world, if you're involved in something that's very timely and you have a chance to make a difference, you sometimes have to grab that chance, which is how this, um, lecture came about. So I wrote the article for outside magazine and I've since giving this lecture for the Wilderness Medical Society, I gave, I gave it um, in Switzerland last month at the International Commission for Alpine Rescue. And so that's when I give the same talk today. I'm going to go kind of fast because I want to finish in 40 minutes or less. Um, but I'm going to talk about um, rescues on Mount Hood. So I've been a rescue mountaineer for 22 years on Mount Hood and the surrounding areas. And this year, 2022, we've had a record number of rescues, a record number in the Alpine. We're at about 16 missions in the Alpine. And our team uh, from Hood River, Oregon is sitting at about 52 missions for the year. And normally we're about 25. So it's more than one a week. And so, um, you know, I live in Hood River, Oregon. It's a uh, town, a county of 25,000 people. So it's quite small. And it's just been incredibly, incredibly busy. So um, I'm going to talk about Mount Hood. Let me uh, share my screen. And like I said, I'm going to go pretty fast. I probably won't be able to watch the chat, but um, I'm okay if you want to interrupt me. Uh, can everybody see that? Okay. Yes. So first rescue of the year uh, was on the summit of Mount Hood. January 23rd, I was up there climbing with three other mountain rescue friends. We were just climbing and skiing. This picture's on the summit of Mount Hood. We got a call. We're about 15 minutes from the summit of Mount Hood. The sheriff knew we were up there because we let him know we were gonna be available. And um, we got a call and said, there's a guy on the summit of Mount Hood. We don't know what's wrong. He can't get down. He's stuck. He's having a panic attack. And I said, you're kidding me, right? And uh, he said, nope. <laughs> And so this is our first mission of the year. Most of the time, our first mission of the year comes at the beginning of climbing season on Mount Hood, which is March. But there's really not a climbing season anymore on Mount Hood in Oregon. The people climb this mountain year round. We were up on an Alpine issue, an Alpine uh, mission uh, just uh, five, six weeks ago, uh, rescuing somebody who was uh, up high in the mountain, tried to summit in August and fell and hurt themselves. So uh, actually that was not August, it was early September. So it's just very, very busy up on Mount Hood. And this is the guy, he was had a crampon failure, had no ice axe, um, had very little skills. And we 
um, short roped him down off the summit. Um, now I don't have any conflict of in interest here. All these pictures are mine. And I do want to say that all of these images I'm going to show you have been released to the public by the sheriff departments, um, either Clackamas County Sheriff or Hoover Sheriff. So uh, these aren't um, you know, confidentiality violations because they're in the public domain. I'm going to be vague about some injuries because there are some things that are not in the public domain. So we got this guy down, the, um, the climbers over here, if you can see my mouse, and I'm right here with two members from Portland Mountain Rescue. Uh, I'm a member of two teams that covers Mount Hood. Portland Mountain Rescue covers the south side and Hood River Craig Rats covers um, the north side. So two teams. We kicked steps and were able to get this guy uh, down. Say this was crossing uh, the top of the Coleman Glacier. If you've been up on Mount Hood, this is pictures from the hog's back which is the most cl common climbing route to the summit. And um, we had to cross the time because of avalanche uh, danger. And we just got finished with the mission and mission number two, same day, a woman who fell a thousand feet had a knee injury. It wasn't a bad fall, it wasn't a sheer cliff. It was kind of medium angle snow slope, but she was evacuated the same day. So this is the same day at dusk. Now, if you're not familiar with Mount Hood, this is Mount Hood in Oregon. Um, it's Oregon's highest peak. It's 11,243 feet high. The interesting thing about these Cascade volcanoes, which you all know, is like they all have a, a significant prominence. What's that? Okay. So uh, the prominence of Mount Hood is 7,000 feet. So that means it sticks above any other peak, 7,000 feet. And you can drive to 6,000 feet at Timberline Lodge. We think there's somewhere between 10 and 20,000 people that climb every year. And unlike many peaks, it's only an hour drive from 3 million people, Portland metro area. So this is um, a picture in, I think, February, climbing up the south side of Mount Hood, very popular climbing route. This is the White River Glacier, Triangle Moraine. The climbing route here is Hogsback. That's the primary climbing route goes up here through the pearly gates which i'll show you pictures of in a minute and that's the summit of mount hood we typically tend to climb up the pearly gates and tag the summit and then walk along this ridge and ski down this pitch right here the old chute really nice very steep high consequence high consequence if you fall slope but it's a really nice uh, ski these are some fumaroles that are open this is pictures in i think january or february so these fumaroles uh, were open year round this year, which is somewhat unusual. Oftentimes the fumaroles, usually the fumaroles are closed, but if you're a skier and you were around last winter, you know that from basically most of January into February, we had like five weeks of very warm weather. It was like April climbing conditions. So we had very little snow for about <laughs> two months. <clears throat> so January 26th, Climber coming down the summit, walking, fumarole is open. It's like a crevasse, a little bit different, um, but it's uh, open, it's dark, climbing down with his buddies, walked right into the fumarole, fell 30 feet, had a fairly significant multi-system trauma. And this mission was done entirely at night. We had to get him, A, get to him, B, uh, repel into the fumarole and package him. He was packaged in a um, vacuum mattress and a, uh, to cascade litter, haul them out of the fumarole, and then see we had to get them down from uh, this spot at 10,000 feet down to 6,000 feet. So that was a low angle lower using a six mil, 200 meter long rope. This is the mission that the outside magazine editor wanted me to write about. This was a very tragic mission. This was uh, two climbers on the reed head wall. Uh, they were uh, two women climbing and about p.m. on March 6th. They called in a distress call after they fell. One had an ankle injury. One was um, injured, but just kind of banged up. And we deployed, got the first team on the mountain at 9 p.m. And it was very high avalanche danger, really high winds. It was at Illumination Saddle at um, 9,000 feet. It was averaging 40 miles an hour and gusting to 70, uh, pitch dark, very cold. And the first team turned back at midnight. Uh, we got a team to the summit of Mount Hood that then down climbed to the reed and found one person alive and one person deceased. 
and we weren't able to recover that um, deceased person until uh, end of August. So very tragic. Um, two very experienced climbers who fell. Uh, missing snowboarder in the ski area found after three days of searching was uh, a snow suffocation fatality. We searched for four days for a missing skier on Barlow Pass. This skier was not found. It was a cross-country skier. Uh, this happens all the time. People climb from the Pearly Gates. So the Pearly Gates is the final shoot up to the summit of Mount Hood. It's the last um, 600 feet you climb to the summit on the most common climbing route. And this happens a lot on Mount Hood and it's somewhat uh, propagated by misinformation. So people have it in their brains. They have to leave their car at one in the morning. So they get to the summit and off the mountain before it warms up and the rock and ice fall start. The problem with that is people, the two problems that one problem is they get to the summit at six in the morning or five in the morning, and it's bulletproof ice. And that's what happened to this lady. She bulletproof ice at six in the morning and slipped and went sliding a, a thousand feet. The other problem with leaving at one in the morning is it's hard to really, you can't just set a time to leave without looking at the ambient temperature, the presence or absence of wind, cloud cover. I mean, there's so many factors that go into the mountain. I've climbed Mount Hood. I climbed up with my 16 year old daughter in the middle of July and we summited at noon and skied off the mountain at two in the afternoon and we had very safe climbing conditions. So it, it's just, there's so many factors that are dependent on it. Here's another climber did the same thing. This, this uh, man uh, left his car at one in the morning, summited Mount Hood, bulletproof ice, crampon failure, inexperienced, no ice axe and fell 600 feet. I'm sorry, this is a woman, fell 600 feet into a funeral. Let's see if I can turn that down a little. She fell into this funeral right here. Some bystanders pulled her out and brought her to here. When she fell, it was bulletproof rock hard snow I'm right here at about 10 in the morning. I skied all the way to her and never put my crampons on the whole mission because by 10 or 11 o'clock, the snow was soft. It was perfectly safe climbing conditions without even needing crampons. And so, um, you know, this is just a situation where timing makes a big difference. So this lady was packaged in a, in a hypothermia bag and um, uh, airlifted. This was uh, June 24th, so kind of normally what we think of the tail end of the climbing season. And then uh, like a week later, exact thing. This is a man, same thing, left his car at one in the morning, summited, came down, slipped on bulletproof ice and fell. He didn't fall into the fumarole, but he fell into some rocks. And um, so was the evacuation with the Air National Guard, the Army National Guard from Salem. And this, um, he had a multi-system trauma. We packaged him in a hypothermia bag and a litter tarp, some heat blankets. And he was very tenuous. I was pretty worried about him. Uh, we were prepared to do a ground evacuation. We had a team, I'll show you in a second when this camera pans. We had a team ready to ski him off, which is almost as quick as the helicopter if we can ski him to Timberline Lodge and then use the um, air ambulance uh, life flight network. Um, the hoist takes a quite a bit of time. This, uh, this, they use kind of old school techniques on this hoist. They drop a medic first, then they drop the litter, then they pull up the litter, then they pull up the medic. So it's four hoists and it takes uh, a bit of time. So we're, I'm here with a paramedic and there's, uh, that's me and there's another mountain rescuer. This team up here is ready for a uh, ski evacuation if we can't get the climber off. This is the Bergschrund. This is an avalanche path. We are out of the avalanche path. You can't really tell from this picture. And so this person was uh, sent to the hospital, spent five or six days in the trauma unit. So lots and lots of rescues. And I wanna just talk a little bit about what's happening on Mount Hood. If you are a climber, uh, especially in the Cascade Volcanoes, you know that we have natural hazards and then we have human hazards. So the natural hazards, we've got all kinds of cracks. 
crevasses, bertrands, fumaroles, glide cracks. This is a fumarole. This picture is taken in August or uh, July. And this fumarole was open all year. This is the hogs, or the, sorry, this is the devil's kitchen fumarole. This is a, uh, bringing a, a person off the mountain in an akia, a skiable litter. Um, and this is a picture is from January. We almost never see glide cracks in January. We all, these are something we see on the mirror snowfield, uh, for example, on Mount Rainier in, you know, June, July, August, but we hardly ever see these in, um, in January, but it just was so hot um, and so warm in January. Uh, we have quite a few avalanches. I've, I've probably in the last three years seen at least three skier triggered avalanches. This is a natural avalanche on a right above a very popular ski area, um, an illumination saddle. This is something that maybe you're familiar with, you know, in the Northwest. This picture is, this is on Mount Rainier. This is uh, in uh, Edith Basin on Mount Rainier in January. And this is, these are rain runnels, right? We get rain in the mountains. And this is actually fabulous skiing because it rained and then um, five or six days before, and then we got uh, maybe a little dusting of snow, a couple inches of snow, and then it warmed up. And this is really smooth, creamy, soft, slushy snow that was only about three inches deep. So it was really good skiing, but oftentimes rain causes um, ice because we get rain and then it gets cold and it freezes and it's very, very dangerous. Um, this is something we get in the Northwest a lot, lenticular clouds. So this is, um, is when the warm air from the ocean comes over <clears throat> Seattle or the coast range or Portland, and then it hits the snow and it condenses. And so when this happens, um, when you're skiing, it can, it can cause a very immediate and total whiteout. So this is skiing up on Mount Hood in a lenticular cloud that descended upon us. And we know this area very well. This is two of my mountain rescue buddies skiing. And um, this is Ron way down here. But you know, this, is, this can be very, very dangerous. And on Mount Hood, like all the Cascade volcanoes, we have what on Mount Hood we call the Mount, Mount Hood Triangle. And we had somebody even this year get caught in the Mount Hood Triangle, even though it's widely publicized as a very common hazard. And so the Mount Hood Triangle is when you are on a volcano which is a cone and you if you need to your our mountain rescue truck is parked down here in this parking lot this is due south that's mount jefferson right there and if you want to get back to the truck in white out you got to ski down through the ski resort here but if it's white out and you are from this point where i'm standing taking this picture and just ski right down the fall line i'm going to go down here into zigzag canyon which there's no way out except for back uphill and so, because as you go down a cone, if you're only one degree off, as you descend, you get farther and farther and farther away from your car. So the Mount Hood Triangle, um, it's fairly straightforward to address this problem by just following magnetic south on your compass. So human hazards. So this picture is from uh february on mount hood and this is these are the pearly gates so extremely crowded so these are you can only have one person go up or one person go down you can't pass in these they're about um four feet wide they're about 40 to 50 degrees steep there's almost always an ice step that's four to six feet in these um in these chutes once in a while there's snow ramps all the way to the top i've skied down them once when they were snow ramps but mostly there's an ice step that you need two tools to get around or one tool if you're really good, one tool in a, in a ski pole. But, um, but another thing that happens on Mount Hood erroneously is people use a glacier travel technique, which is roping up without an anchor because you're crossing a low angle glacier or a flat glacier and you're trying to protect somebody from falling straight down into a crevasse. That's a glacier travel rope technique. People use that technique on Mount Hood in this spot, which they need to use a steep slope technique, which is an anchored uh, rope. And so what happens is people, uh, multiple times people have climbed up here, roped together and one person falls and they, everybody on the rope team gets swept down because you can't stop somebody from falling unless you're using a short rope technique, which is really a guide technique. 
And so if you don't have a rope anchor, it's way safer to not use a rope when climbing Mount Hood. When I climbed with my 16 year old daughter, we climbed to the summit without rope, but, uh, I, but she wanted a rope on the way down. So I anchored it with a picket. So you can't simul climb unless you're, you know, Conrad anchor or somebody, but anyway, so very, very, very crowded. Uh, we have a lot of people going out unprepared. This is a guy who climbed Munro Point in, I think, April. While it was raining in the parking lot, there was snow on the top. To get to the top of Munro Point, it's a fifth class kind of scramble. And he wore, was wearing shorts and flip-flops. So he ended up spending the night out, lost his flip-flops. We found him hypothermic and we made him shoes out of Sam splints to walk him down. So um, people going up unprepared. We have a lot of people climbing Mount Hood with crampons and they're ill-fitting or people climbing Mount Hood with soft hiking boots and um, and they don't work very well on, on ice. Here's another phenomenon that's happening in today's um, outdoor world, oops, is people want light gear and people want lighter and lighter and lighter equipment. And if you're a trail runner, you know, trail runners are going out with minimal gear but this ski stuff that is really light and I really like it I have a pair of these bindings it's really nice to have four pound skis and you know bindings that weigh 400 grams but they're not very durable so this is a picture of probably the sixth ski binding ever paired in the last five or six years um, this is the last uh, run of a tour with my mountain rescue buddies my ski friends and we were able to repair this binding so my friend here could uh, ski out um, here's another phenomenon that's happening, uh, FKTs, fastest known time. So there were more FKT sent set in the United States in trail running during COVID than ever before, because all of these very fit, uh, highly skilled athletes who are used to competing on ultra runs had nobody to compete with because there were no races. So they were all competing with each other by trying to do fastest known times. And so here's a guy who did an incredible feat of athleticism he climbed Mount Hood in an hour and 40 minutes up and skied down. Incredible. So if I'm going really fast with no brakes uh, and, and moving quickly, um, I can climb it in three plus hours and ski down in 45 minutes. Um, I hardly ever do that because we usually ski down and take our time and take some pictures. But um, this is incredible how fast he did. But you can see if... He had some kind of problem, even if it wasn't his fault, even if a rock fell on him or somebody fell and crashed into him, you know, he's not dressed for somebody who can survive a incident in the mountains. And so that's the problem we're seeing on Mount Hood. People are going out and doing really cool things, but they are not prepared. Um, here's another thing, you know, social media. Social media is a huge benefit now, because back when I started uh, climbing and ski mountaineering, we had to, if we wanted route conditions, we had to call the ranger, maybe, maybe not get a hold of the climbing ranger. If we got a hold of the climbing ranger, maybe, maybe not, maybe, maybe not, they'd been on the mountain recently. So it's very hard to get any information. So we just planned a weekend and we went and we got what we got and we had to turn back if it was bad, we did. But nowadays I can see on social media, my friends and my acquaintances who have climbed Mount Hood and I can get pretty good information um, on um, the, the route conditions. I can get it like one minute after somebody summited sometimes. The problem is, as you all know, it's not always accurate and it's not always truthful. And so this is a big problem. So here's a guy who climbed Mount Hood in running shoes and micro spikes, which is a thing now. Um, and you, we don't know if this guy was guided. We don't know if he had a top rope. We don't know what the conditions were. And so people who read this, who think that it's okay to climb Mount Hood with running shoes and micro spikes, that's a problem. And we've seen this, I've been on the mountain at least three or four times this year where people have been um, in running shoes and micro spikes and it's just not safe unless you uh, have just incredible ideal conditions. Um, it's not a great, um, it's not a great uh, technique for climbing a glaciated peak. So this happened in all over. I just spoke at the International Commission for Alpine Rescue in Montreux, Switzerland, and teams from uh, the Pyrenees all the way to um, 
uh, Zakopane, Poland to Norway, people around the world are having issues with a lot of people climbing in the mountains and skiing and getting into trouble. And a lot of it is post um, pandemic. A lot of it is accessible gear. A lot of it is, um, it's very popular right now to be in the backcountry. It's the most common, it's the most fastest growing segment of the ski industry is actually backcountry. So this is a picture of Mount St. Helens um, in February. We never get crowds like this in February. This is a crowd more like, um, you know, June. And here's Mount St. Helens. You can see this big string of people. We've had problems on Mount Hood. Here's the body recovery from Mount St. Helens um, this year in, I think, um, I think this is April. This is a person who died on the summit and we did a short haul with a, with a helicopter uh, to bring that body off the summit. This is like a um, reverse heli skiing because we, Ron and I skied to the top and we found the guy and then we got a, a helicopter ride off the top. Um, this is a patrol we did at Mount Rainier and this is the only picture I have that I could really show, but this is, uh, we went after three people in soft hiking boots, cotton clothing, who were, it was a beautiful day on Mount Hood. They went out for a climb or a snow hike basically on the mirror snow field, or actually they went up just to go to Panorama Point saw a bunch of people up on the mirror snow field and thought, oh, there's people going up, let's just keep going up. And they didn't have any traction devices, um, backpacks with just, you know, snacks in them and, and a little bit of water, like I said, cotton sweatpants. And they um, got lost at about 9 p.m. and we went up and fetched them. And luckily there were four people from my mountain rescue team because we were up there on patrol as a guest patrol. And luckily we had a climbing ranger with us because navigating down the mirror field at night is very, very difficult. And so we had a climbing ranger. We were in charge of, of uh, the patients and the climbing ranger was navigating. So this is a belay station at Panorama Point. So uh, what are we doing? Um, we've got a number of techniques that we're addressing this as the rescue mountaineering teams. One is uh, social media. So the Portland Mountain Rescue is based in Portland, Oregon. Three million people in the Portland metro area. Portland Mountain Rescue has about um, 50 field deployable rescues. They're not as busy as the Crag Rats. So Portland Mountain Rescue is kind of an alpine team, mainly uh, about 15 missions this year. And so they have a group that has really taken control of and done a fabulous job at social media. And so Facebook page, Instagram page, partner with the Mountain Shop to which, so we give lectures at the Mountain Shop, uh, safety lectures, that's a that's a big, one of the premier um, backcountry ski and mountaineering shops in Portland. We have a YouTube channel and we have a really cool podcast. And so we try to give objective information. So on social media and that's really important and you know you if you're all you're all in medical school so you know you know giving facts coupled with opinion if you clearly delineate your opinion is okay but on social media it's, it's just best to give a clear direction so something like you say something like the devil's kitchen fumarole is open you can't see it very well from above we recommend going ascending climbers right of devil's kitchen so a clear hazard and a clear uh, recommendation as opposed to, yay, I summited Mount Hood and microspikes. So which doesn't really give any information. And so we try to be very objective about route conditions and give advice. And we really have a pretty good following. Uh, the other thing we're doing is because we're so busy on Mount Hood and we do so many missions with multiple agencies, we're really trying to follow incident command. And so many of you may have experience with this, um, either in a job you had before medical school or maybe during COVID you used incident command. But incident command is a way you can communicate with multiple teams, use the same language and everybody has a clear designated role. So this is a command built for a body recovery on Mount Hood for this year. And so everybody knows who's in charge, everybody knows who the safety officer is, who's operations chief, who's the um, recovery, who's the backup group, who's the snowcat group. So to make it very 
very clear. So communication is just really, really important. And so we use the incident command system. We're trying to start our medical training. So I'm a medical director for four um, star teams and taught uh, 32 people this year. And we're teaching another 30 people uh, in January, 2023, uh, emergency medical responder. And in fact, the uh, Wilderness Medicine Institute in Oregon Health Sciences came up, a bunch of the med students came up and helped us teach. And it was real fun to have that crew. And so we, we decided to teach EMR instead of WFR. WFR is wilderness first responder. EMR is emergency medical responder. They're between 60 and 80 hour courses. But EMR is approved by the state department of health and you can get licensed as an EMS provider and do advanced care as an EMS provider. It's one step below EMT. And so, um, I have protocols for my teams and these folks can do more advanced care. Wilderness first responder is a great class, but technically if you have this class, you still can only practice at the first level legally. You can't really practice medicine. You can't reduce a dislocated shoulder, for example. So that's what we decided to do, wilderness EMR. We had a bull rescue training. So this is the, it's a skiable litter. If you're, if you've ever done any ski patrol work, or you're doing a ski patrol active, you'll know that ski patrollers know how to use this, but not very many mountain rescuers know how to use this device. And so it used to take us three hours to do a rope uh, lower system from either Devil's Kitchen on the south side of Mount Hood, or in this case, um, a glacier on the south side of Mount Hood. It used to take us three hours using a 200 meter rope, uh, five or six belay stations. Uh, takes us, um, about 20 minutes skiing the patient down. This is skiing a body down on a plane crash on hood, but it's a very efficient way to travel over snow, but you really have to practice with this. So we really, we have about 10 people now that can ski the slitter down with many, many days of practicing. We just resort and get ski patrol to help us. And we pop it on the lit on lift, get the chair up, ski it down with a bunch of weight in it, or maybe a volunteer patient. And then Again, and just do laps, laps in the ski resorts. We a lot of time on. Uh, we're doing a lot of patrols nowadays. So, um, Portland Mountain Rescue has a patrol. They used to uh, used to have a patrol during the climbing season on weekends, um, March through June. And th this year, we started patrols weekends, January, and had several weekday patrols and went all through the end of July and into August. So patrol is on the mountain with your um, rescue kit and a radio, letting the sheriff know ahead of time. So if there's a call, you're already on and the sheriff knows you're there and you can respond very quickly. We've had a route. Um, this is a very, very challenging um, Craig Rats uh, in, in Hood River, we started in 1926. So we're 96 years old and we're a small town and we barely have time to do rescues and keep up our training and our certifications. So we don't have time to train people. So we just got three new members this year, rock star members, and they are all, all highly skilled ski mountaineers and um, it's, we don't have to train them. You know, they already know how to use Gaia and Caltoto, and they're already familiar with radio use. One of them's a mountain guide, one of them's a forest service firefighter. Portland Mountain Rescue has a little different program. Uh, we have, Portland Mountain Rescue, we have, uh, you know, about 15, 10 to 15 missions a year. We have 60 field deployable rescuers and, um, a big swath of downtime from when the Alpine season ends in August uh, until basically December. So we have time to do more formal training. So we can take somebody who maybe doesn't have uh, Alpine skills and train them. And we have a fabulous academy and run them through navigation, uh, survival, avalanche, all those modules. It's like a Thursday lecture followed by a Saturday outdoor class. It's a great program, but um, and so two different styles of recruiting. 
There's going to be a fee permit on Mount Hood. We think that'll help curb some of the um, missions, but we don't know. This is going to be brand new for 2023. You have to have a fee permit to climb Mount Rainier, Denali in Alaska, Mount St. Helens, Mount Adams, Shasta, Three Sisters, but there's no permit right now required to climb Mount Hood. And so starting in 2023, there's going to be a $20 fee permit to climb Mount Hood or $100 season pass. So it's kind of a small step at helping defray the cost of search and rescue, but also um, but also uh, maybe curb some of the crowds. Um, we'll see. Um, and so the last thing, um, I've talked for about 35 minutes, so it's about right. The last thing, um, you know, how does that impact rescuers? Well, I think, you know, we just finished the Alpine season and then we had this rescue. And this was a, a river rescue about a mile from my house. And so we were fortunate that we had uh, seven uh, rescue mountaineers on this mission within about five minutes of the call. But, you know, it's just a lot of stress. You know, it's a lot of... Um, it's a lot of extra work. It's a lot of expense. It's a lot of cleaning gear, repairing gear, buying our own gear, uh, waxing skis, repairing skis. But it's just unbelievably uh, rewarding camaraderie and um, and a very way to practice medicine in a place that basically a lot of places where nobody would ever go. You know, we go into canyons and areas of the mountains where nobody would ever go, but that's where people fall or that's where people get lost. And so we find ourselves um, in very special places. And so it's, it's quite rewarding. Um, it doesn't pay very well, but it pays basically nothing. <laughs> We're all volunteers, but um, it's quite rewarding. So I have a few more slides, but I think I'll stop there. It's kind of a quick tour of the problem and the solutions and then we got a few minutes. Um, we can uh, chat if you guys have questions, even if it's not about Mount Hood. I'm happy to take questions for anything. I have a question about the um, your comment about the EMR. Was it E? What were the two different certifications, Woofer and then? Wolfer and EMR, emergency medical responder. EMR. Yeah. So as a woofer, like I am trained to uh, reduce shoulder dislocations. And is it just that in Oregon, a woofer is not allowed to reduce the, like a shoulder dislocation? So very important question. And I'm so glad you asked it. Mm -hmm. I love the Wolfer course. It's a fabulous course. Mm -hmm. The problem with taking the Wolfer course is it's just a course. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it doesn't give you a license. It doesn't give you a certification. Yep. It doesn't give you permission to practice medicine. So mm -hmm. can you reduce a shoulder dislocation in any state in the United States? Most states, you would not be able to do that, especially if you were functioning mm -hmm. in an official capacity, like a mm -hmm. guide mm -hmm. or speed controller. You can't practice medicine without a license. You can't, a lot of people in Wolfer class are given Rocephin, unreconstituted Rocephin, because rightfully so if they're in the back country and somebody's got an infection and they're two days out man i am shot of rocephin almost anybody can be trained to give that it's very safe very effective but you're practicing medicine so it's not lawful so that's the problem is the things that you're trained in a wolfer and the things that you're trained in emr are exactly the same we basically taught a wolfer course but the people who took the emr all got licensed in the state of Oregon in the EMS system. So they have a license to practice under my, if they're under my teams, they're under my license. Does that make sense? Yes. So that's the big reason to, to that's, there are many, many search and rescue teams are moving towards EMR instead of wilderness first responder. Mm -hmm. So if you can take the Wolfer, it's fabulous. If you need it for an official capacity, like if you're a ski patroller and you take a Wolfer, you can't use any of those skills beyond basic first aid. Mm -hmm. You're only allowed to, to practice basic first aid mm -hmm. as a ski controller because you're functioning in an official capacity. Mm -hmm. So we basically taught a Wolfer class, but it was approved in the as the um, as an EMR class. And in fact, for 2023, we're going to recertify people who are Wolfers. Thank you.
Yep. Back okay, to the yeah. talk, uh, Dr. Van Tilburg. I just wanted to ask um, if, uh, if you have any thoughts. I volunteer with one of the mountain rescue organizations up here in Squamish, British Columbia, uh, just north of you guys. And one of the questions that comes up to us a lot now that we're approaching 160 rescues uh, a year is whether or not we ever consider moving towards some kind of paid system just as we increase capacity and the rescues keep coming the kind of comes this point where you wonder how sustainable things are and we've certainly you know rose to the occasion as far as scaling up as best we can but the administrative burden is pretty high and i just wonder if it comes to you guys on your side at all like if if there is a capacity or a ceiling or uh, you know what you imagine of the future for search and rescue because we are in a very changing time i think well that's a great question and we i heard your colleagues from um vancouver bc talk at icar uh international commission for alpine rescue last month in switzerland and though that team is also struggling as you are and as we are with a lot of um a lot of rescues there at, was a time in at least in the united states for fire departments to start doing search and rescue and the reason because especially rural fire departments with fire suppression, they're really not very busy. And so there was a push for a while to do for fire departments. The problem with at least what we saw in our community in Oregon was that the fire, the fire volunteer and paid fire departments weren't, they were first firefighters and then outdoor people. Whereas those of us who do mountain rescue, like we live and breathe the outdoors, right? We, on our days off, we're cycling and skiing and climbing. And so we're using these techniques all the time. And so when a rescue comes, we're like, okay, this is what I do all the time. It's a little bit different. So we had, we're, we're, we refine those skills and the firefighters we found didn't have the outdoor skills to walk all night, to spend the night out. So if firefighters don't do it, the next um, question is, yeah, do you do you pay search and rescue teams? And there are teams um, that in North America that do things like give the rescuers a stipend, give them thousand bucks a year to do um, to buy you know boots and new ski pants and skis. Um, I think uh, the European model where they have paid professional rescuers in the Alps probably won't happen in North America because we're just so spread out geographically. So I think that's gonna, until we get a better helicopter system, I think we probably will continue to be volunteers. So the third solution, firefighters being one that didn't work very well, paying ground rescuers being the second, the third would be regional helicopters. And in Norway, they, they did this, I heard them speak at, um, uh, at ICAR also, and they have, I think, eight helicopter stations in that country, and they service the entire country. They've got them strategically stationed so they can have a five-person, 10-person rescue team anywhere in the country in like two hours. And so that may be the most, that may be the future. So if I were if I were young in my career in wilderness medicine and search and rescue, I probably would not do a wilderness medicine fellowship, but do an EMS fellowship. Because I think probably aeromedical helicopter EMS is probably the most likely solution to your question. Thank you, appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Van Tilburg, thank you so much for being here. I had a question. Thank you. Not that? Go ahead. Uh, my question had to do with um, my background in firefighting. Uh, I was a wilderness CMT, and we always ran into a problem of uh, having medical direction in one state, but then going down to California or something and not technically being licensed. I'm just wondering, in, in your uh, in your circles, have you found any uh, movements to try and make a national like uh, medical direction system for people in those kind of land agencies that have to go state to state? God, that is just a great question. Also, you guys are asking questions really on the forefront of wilderness medicine. It's really great. Um, 
Um, that's a big problem. So in, in, I practice in Oregon, Washington, and California. I have those three licenses. In California, I do telemedicine, but we, but, um, we, can, we can, in Oregon and Washington have, um, border counties have permission to cross the border and practice under their state license. So a Southern Washington state medic can come into Oregon on a call for a transport and practice and uh, under their um, Washington license. But the sheriff department can't ask for mutual aid from a neighboring state until they've exhausted their state resources. So um, for example, if, I, if we have a call on Mount Adams in Washington, the trailhead is an hour and a half from my house but the mountain rescue team from Yakima, Central Washington Mountain Rescue, is three and a half hours from the trailhead. But the sheriff has to call regional state agencies first before they call us. So um, I think at some point, maybe in your career, you'll see a national medical license or a national EMS license. But right now, we don't have one. Uh, during COVID, a lot of states made it really easy to practice, especially because of telemedicine, but um, to practice without a state license on a neighboring state. But I, I think we're going to see that eventually, but I don't know when that'll happen. But I mean, it's ridiculous. If you're, if you get hired by a telemedicine, say you want to do, be a telemedicine hospitalist or telemedicine neurologist, and you want to cover nine or 10 states, um, rural hospitals, very efficient way to use medical resources You've got to get licensed in all 10 of those states. Um, and so I think what the wildland firefighters do, you probably know they get, if they have to go out of state, they get adopted by the federal or they get, they get assigned to a federal team. And so they practice without a license under a federal mandate for wildland firefighters. But um, I haven't seen much action with that, but it's going to happen probably at some point. Thank you so much for uh, sharing all that. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty good. So question on the patrol. If you are out patrolling on the weekends and you see someone that looks like a rescue like waiting to happen, do you give them the benefit of the doubt or do you intervene and try to do stuff ahead of time? So we're very proactive and and you know, like all of you, all of you who are out and about in the, you know, in the mountains and cycling or trail running or whatever you can see something from, you know, 50 feet away and say, oh, that looks like a problem. So we tend to be very proactive. And I think because we're mountain rescuers and we've done this so much, we tend to approach people um, sort of calmly and, um, you know, uh, non-threatening and, you know, say, hey, are you guys all okay? Are everything okay? But we definitely, definitely, definitely try to be as proactive as possible. We see people glissading with crampons on, for example, and try to just gently educate them and say, hey, if you keep going with your crampons on, you're going to break your femur. Um, but we don't say it like that. You know, we say it in a kind, polite manner, but we definitely try to be proactive as much as possible. But it's hard. Thank you. Have you noticed a huge difference in the uh, number of rescues required on mountains that have permit systems versus don't? And to follow that up, permit systems that are in place, are there certain requirements to obtain the permit beyond saying, I think I can do this and here's 20 bucks? Um, do they ask you for previous experience or experience within somebody uh, in your party? Yeah, great question. So. The best example of that, and I'm not going to give you specifics because I don't remember them, but the best example of that is Denali. So Denali uh, surged in popularity for climbing in Alaska in early 90s, late 80s, early 90s. Just there was everybody wanted to climb Denali. There was a lot of interest in climbing Everest and people climbed Denali before they climbed Everest. And that was when you know, the big disaster in 1996 happened. And so there's all of these accidents on Denali and it was crazy. There were so many people and so many accidents. So not only did the Denali mountaineering rangers and the, um, and the ranger, 
station there put a permit system in place, but they put a mandatory briefing. And I don't know the specifics, maybe somebody who's climbed in Ollie and who's, uh, who's on this call can maybe provide the specifics, but mandatory safety video, mandatory in-person briefing by a ranger, get mandatory gear check before you got your climbing permit. And that dramatically changed the number of accidents they had on Denali. So the moral of the story is, as you alluded to, the permit system helps, but the education piece is really, really important. And so I'm trying to get the Forest Service on Mount Hood to have some kind of a three minute safety video people have to watch before they buy their permit or some, some kind of educational piece. But, but the, it's not the permit that necessarily helps, but it's the education that couples that accompanies the permit. So, and somebody mentioned getting a backpacking permit in Glacier, you had to do that. What, what did you have? I don't know who wrote that. Uh, what did you have to do when to go backpacking in Glacier? Did you have to watch some kind of safety video or? Yeah, we had to meet with the ranger in their shack and they had a, a safety video that went over bear safety and uh, exposure and, and to the elements and whatnot. Maybe they checked out our gear and everything. So it's yeah. really cool that you're talking about that. I had to do that this summer. I thought it was a good yeah. idea. So that's very, very effective at um, reducing accidents, that education piece, that mandatory education piece. And when it's mandatory to get your permit, everybody's like, oh, okay, I got to do it. So I'll just do it as opposed to, you know, if it's voluntary, you know, who's going to do something extra with voluntary because we're all so busy. So that's great. I'm great to hear they're doing that in Glacier Peak or Glacier National Park. They do a similar thing on Rainier where you have to, the ranger like comes around and um, does rounds in the evening before you climb and you have, they like tell you about the route and they kind of go over all the um, safety stuff and make sure you have the right gear. And then Rainier National Park also makes you pay the like $50 annual body recovery fee. Right. Which okay. I think goes to their search and rescue. Okay. Yeah. Good to see you, Aaron. Yeah, good to see you too. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, thanks for, uh, I, I climbed Mount Rainier so long ago, but I remember we had to pick up our permit in person and meet face-to-face -face with a ranger. Yeah, so thanks, that's good. So that that's where the big difference is. And you guys will see that, you know, you guys will see that in medicine, you know, when you have a 11 year old 70 kilo kid who comes in with the first presentation of diabetes, right? It's that education piece you have a snapshot in time to maybe make a, a slight difference. It's that education piece that's so important. I have a question about the um, patrols, if that's all right. Um, so I, <clears throat> I um, taught wilderness medicine, woofer and WEMT for Knowles for 11 years before I uh, changed track and went to medical school. Um, so I'm kind of coming at this from the perspective of uh, um, risk management. It seems to me that uh, even though this is sort of the climbing ranger model anyway, it seems like having uh, people out on patrol, especially in overcrowded conditions, could be a pretty serious uh, uh, risk to these people who are out there. And I'm just interested in the... Um, in your thoughts about uh, increased risk on patrol versus having to scramble a team overnight, uh, or I mean, not overnight, because I'm sure they're not patrolling overnight, but scramble a team uh, ad hoc. Um, is it uh, so much of an added benefit or is it a risk to the teams? Uh, I would say, so when I say patrol, you know, we're, you know, we're skiing for fun, you know, 70 times a year. So if, 35 of those times we call the sheriff and say, we're going to be on the South side available for a rescue. We're going to, most of the time we're going to be up there anyway, but not all the time. Um, the biggest benefit from having a patrol is getting somebody off the mountain in daylight. That's the biggest benefit. So if we're up, because all of us have a minimum of an hour response time driving, assuming we're at home and we're not doing anything and we can get into our, you know, mountain kit, and jump in the car, meet everybody at the at the truck and drive up the mountain, minimum of an hour time 
to the staging area and then we got to get up the mountain. So the biggest benefit is being able to do respond to a mission um, in daylight. The second benefit would be we had of the 14, 15 missions we had in the Alpine this year, uh, three were critical, four were critical, and one of those decompensated in the helicopter. So we kind of barely got them off the mountain on time. And um, one of them died because we couldn't get them off the mountain on time. But so I think either once in a while, it's it's time critical because it's trauma. But you're right, the, off, the offset is if we have, you know, I've been up on the mountain where we've had a Craig Rat team and two Portland Mountain Rescue teams and there's 15 people from the both mountain rescue teams climbing. So that's 15 extra people on the mountain. There's probably time for one more question if anybody has a question. Um, so you mentioned that you were able to work with uh, the military. What is the criteria uh, for a rescue to get the like the National Guard involved? Well, that's a great question. Um, it's generally has to be life limb or eyesight uh, for a wilderness area to use mechanized um, motorized evacuation um, we fudge that sometime and use rescuer safety as a reason to get the military involved we had a um you all probably remember in 2002 we had a seven million dollar pave hawk crash on mount hood during a rescue and so that curbed helicopter rescuers rescues for a couple of years and then in 2018 we had a fatality uh trauma patient that's whose family sued Clackamas County for delay of uh, getting a rescue of a helicopter. So it, a lot of, probably too much, but a lot of thought and discussion goes into whether or not a rescue with a helicopter is appropriate. And so one of the missions this year, I made the recommendation along with a highly skilled rescue mountaineer on the phone when I was driving up to respond, um, I made the recommendation to the sheriff to activate a helicopter. Um, and then on another one this year, we didn't activate a helicopter until we were on the mountain with the patient. And so it's a tough judgment call because helicopters are not necessarily safe. It's a lot of uh, machinery up on the mountain with people who skilled pilots, but pilots that are generally skilled in combat search and rescue and combat, um, aeromedical transport, not necessarily uh, glaciated peaks. And so um, it's, a, it's a decision that's not made easily. And so it's, if we think it's gonna save time and the patient's critical, we're likely to call a helicopter, but we're pretty quick skiing somebody off the mountain. So if we think it's not gonna save time and the weather's good and the patient's not critical, we'll oftentimes not call a helicopter but a lot of thought goes into it. And if I'm up on the mountain and the sheriff running the mission is down in the parking lot, it's, it's a lot of chit chat on the radio or via cell phone. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yeah. All right, um, well, thank you so much for hosting this talk. It was very informative. And I think we all learned quite a bit about the Mount Hood situation. And um, I know I'm excited to get involved someday once I have a little bit more free time on my hands. <laughs> yeah. Um, <I> don't feel <laughs> uh, but yeah, for those of you who will be attending the conference, Dr. Van Tilburg will be uh, presenting there as well. So you can try to find him and, and ask any more questions you have during that event. Um, so we'll be sending out more information about that conference this week for those of you in the various schools. Uh, and again, that's going to be hosted January 6th through 8th. Um, so otherwise, thank you very much for your time tonight, Dr. Montilberg. And uh, yeah, we look forward to seeing you at the conference. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.